insulin resistance is a normal, natural, indicated, and useful biological process. It is not a pathology, and it is not the cause of diabetes. The diet that these so-called scientists and nutrition are telling us will kill us, that's the one that's optimal for human beings, actually. The facts of the matter are very clear. There is no such thing as healthy plant foods. That is an ideology. That is a propaganda that people have been sold for about a hundred years by people who have an axe to grind. You need to understand, the reason that you eat food is so that you might live. It is not the other way around. In your opinion, why is the human diet this thing that we can't come to a common agreement on? It's such a foundational piece for us as humans, and it seems no matter how far we go down the rabbit hole, we can't come to any common terms. Why would you say that is? Okay. I think it's a combination, Jesse, of a couple of things. First of all, Money is at play here, a lot of money, huge amounts of money. And there are people who want to push a certain barrow because at the end of the tax year, their profits depend upon that entirely. And so they will pay off scientists, nutrition scientists. They'll pay off physiologists. They'll pay off all sorts of people who are supposed to be informing on knowledge to find what they want them to find. And then those scientists, so-called, will go ahead and make their rubbish look like science to fool the unwashed masses, basically. And that's how the whole thing is perpetuated. At the end of the day, it all comes back to money. Because when you apply common sense and actual science to the question of what's likely to be the best diet for a human being, the question is very, very clearly answerable without any equivocality at all. So there it is. It's down to money. Well, let's get into the details then. You say it's a clear answer when it comes down to science and we get into the nuance here and the physiology. Explain that and what we've come to. Okay. In my years studying human nutrition to date and teaching human nutrition to postgraduate students and researching in the area myself, I've learned a few things that seem to have escaped some people for some reason. Number one, the worst possible diet for a human being, other than no food at all, is the standard Western or standard American diet. The mixed macronutrient diet made up of significant amounts of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. That diet will kill you quicker than anything else. Secondly, a vegan diet, which is being promoted heavily, not only by vegans, but also by the powers that be, Agenda 21, all that kind of stuff, that diet is absolutely superior to the standard diet for a period of about five years, give or take, after which it will be disastrous because it's destitute of nutrition and you will end up in a very, very serious situation if you attempt to continue veganism beyond about five years. Now, some people last longer. Absolutely, Jesse, they do. Some people don't last that long. There is a, a variation around it. That's an average value. The statistics tell us that 84% of people who ever go vegan quit, they do that within five years, and 90% of those people cite catastrophic health failure as the reason for quitting veganism. Okay. That leaves us with a diet which is basically devoid of plant material, carbohydrates, etc., and it's a diet which is rich in animal fat and protein. The diet that these so-called scientists and nutrition are telling us will kill us that's the one that's optimal for human beings, actually. How do I know that? Well, evolution is a thing. It's not a theory. It's not a hypothesis. It's a thing. It occurs. We have observed it occurring. We can observe it occurring every day if we want to. This is not a question. Does that mean theology is wrong and there's no God? No, I didn't say that. This may well be the method by which a creator has put all this in play. I don't know. What I do know is that four and a half million years of both positive and negative selection pressures have led the human body to be molded 
in such a way as to be absolutely ideally suited for eating the muscle meat and associated fat of large ruminant animals mostly, with very little to no plant material at all, in fact. Um, that is the diet which is associated, at least anecdotally in recent times, with some of the most stunning health turnarounds you could possibly imagine. And it makes sense because that's the genes we've got. That's what we've selected for. So, uh, you know, if you're looking for the science to underpin any assertion about human nutrition, the last place you should look is in the nutrition science area in the peer-reviewed literature. All of that is a ring-fenced area of ideology that's bought and paid for. All of it is pseudoscience. There's nothing worth spending more than a day or so even looking at in there, in the entire field. And that's coming from someone who's worked in that field for two decades. Okay, so I'm not just poking nonsense at them because I don't like them for some reason. Um, I've been in there, up to my armpits in it, so I know what goes on in there. If you're enjoying the episode, take a second and let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much, and now back to the episode. Okay, a couple different nuances I want to get into within that then. You mentioned ruminant animals. So... We can use your diet, for example, somebody who is aware of the ideal way we're supposed to be eating. And again, you've been in this world for decades. How much of the diet should be room in animals? I might not be the best example, Jesse, because while, I, while I'm happy to say this is what is ideal, this is what a given human being should strive towards and should probably do to ideally support their health, longevity, etc., I adhere to that myself between 90 to 95% across time. There are periods where I will go off piste because I'm a human being and a hedonist. Okay. Ideally, what a person should do is what I do most of the time, which is probably 80% of everything I eat is the muscle meat of beef, not organs, the muscle meat and the associated fat, plus or minus butter, usually plus butter, salt, water, that's pretty much it. So 20% of everything I eat is not beef, muscle, meat, and associated fat or butter. So that's pork, fish, chicken, lamb, everything else is a, a very small percentage of my diet. And when you have those other meats, do you feel like it's less nutritious, like you're taking a hit on your nutrition and doing it so you have some variety? How do you look at that? Not really. Um, I don't feel any different having eaten fish or chicken or pork. I mean, lamb is another ruminant. It's just not a large one. So it's very similar to beef in terms of it's... it's the thing that differs between the different animals is actually the, the fatty acid profile of of the meats and fats. And I actually don't think this is hugely important. I wouldn't suggest that you base your diet on chicken because of the way chickens are reared and antibiotics and all the kind of nonsense around that. I wouldn't suggest that you base your diet on fish and seafood because of mercury poisoning, other heavy metals and things. Um, but... If you were slightly more than 20% and slightly less than 80%, I probably wouldn't be asking for your card back and striking you off the list of genuine carnivores. He never really was a carnivore. He did it wrong, Jesse. That's just a little joke. All right, so we know now what to eat, but let's take this even farther and talk about what the animal ate. So there's you know organic chicken, pasture-raised chicken. How important is it to know... And we can use this with any animal, you know, when it comes to fish, wild caught, beef, grass fed, grass finished. When it comes to nutrition and the benefits we're going to get from that, how important is it we look back at what the animals ate? If a person says to me, I cannot afford grass finished, grass reared beef, I can afford the feedlot stuff. I would still vastly sooner see that person eat that than any amount of plant material at all. 
Now, for, for ideal situation, for choice, if you have the choice, if you can access grass-fed, grass-finished beef and you can afford that, I would say for preference, do that. But I wouldn't die in a ditch over eating grass, uh, non-grass-finished or, or whatever. There is a slight difference in the, in the fatty acid makeup, but I really don't think it's the major concern that going, oh, we'll sort it, then I'm not going to eat meat because I can't get grass-fed, so I'm going to eat plants instead. That would be a mistake. Okay. In New Zealand, we're lucky. We, we only have grass, red, grass-finished meat. There's nothing else to be had, um, probably because we're a lot closer to the equator than the North American continent, for example. Um, so it's just not even an issue here. Okay, taking that even another layer further, what about meat that is raised on a farm versus wild meat and people that are hunting or getting meat from somebody that's out actually hunting? And then another layer to that is looking at the actual animal reading. I mean, there's something like a deer that's more, I would say, from my knowledge at least, is more likely to be a natural meat versus a cow that has likely been bred from another animal to what we have today. The example there is an interesting one because if given a choice between cattle and um, deer meat, venison, as the staple, I'm going beef every single time because venison is very, very lean and and there's not enough fat there to sustain a human in good health status if that's all they were eating or if that's mostly what they were eating. Um, cattle tend to carry much more fat and our nutrition really has come largely from cattle for several thousand years around the agrarian revolution. Prior to that, it was actually mammoth mostly, uh, and mammoth is a slightly different beast again. Um, I mean, they're even more fatty, for example. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's the best, it seems to be the best in terms of what's biochemically suited to the human physiology, not because of some miracle, but precisely because that's what we have been eating. And so our bodies have adapted to eating that to optimise to that diet. To which a person might say, well, I could just eat a vegan diet then and my body would optimise to that over time, wouldn't it? No, we're not talking about optimising an individual over a year or two. We're talking about optimising the genes of the species by selecting for and against. So we're talking more geological time here. We're not talking a few years of doing something. All right, coming back to the original point we were making, I said there was a couple of nuances I wanted to dig into. The other one is the fact that you said muscle meat two different times, which means that you're not having organs. And a lot of times in the health and wellness space, those are prized and people talk about the health benefits and how nutrient dense those are. So talk about your feeling on organ meats. Organ meats are completely and utterly unnecessary in the human diet. Do some of the organs contain some things that are touted as positive health supporting things? Sure. Does that mean we should eat those things on balance? No, not when you understand everything else that's in them. My main bugbear with, with organs is liver, particularly. Other organs, brain, spinal cord, bit of this here and there, you know, whatever else. Again, I'm not going to die in a ditch over that and say, give us your card back, you're doing it wrong. But if you're piling in an unnaturally large proportion of liver, you are asking for a problem because you are not designed for that. And liver contains some good things, absolutely. And that's the things that these less than ideally educated people are putting forward as the reason you should eat liver, forgetting entirely the flip side of that coin, whereas, well, what about all the toxins in liver that will do you damage? A lot of people say, oh, you're talking about vitamin A, aren't you? Not really. I'm not convinced about vitamin A toxicity. 
I'll tell you what I am convinced by, though, is copper toxicity. And the level of copper that you will find in liver is vast. And that can really cause you very, very serious problems. Okay. So given everything we've said to this point, 80% of your diet is beef. Would somebody be able to thrive, would you say, on a 100% beef diet? Absolutely, without question. Now, the caveat would be, where is that person coming from? How is their health when they started? What have they been eating? And how sensibly, how slowly did they transition their diet from A to B? If you get nothing else from this discussion today, people, if you want to change your diet from anything to anything else, do not do that overnight. I'm going carnivore tomorrow. I'm going vegan tomorrow. I'm going omnivore tomorrow. Whatever. No. Change your diet over six to eight weeks from what it is to what you want it to be. You must allow your microbiome to adjust to the change in food supply. Otherwise, all hell will break loose at some point, either immediately or on a delayed reaction. And then you'll turn around and blame the diet when it wasn't the diet that caused the problem. It was the fact that you changed your diet too quickly. Often, some months ago, before you actually get the, the disaster. So that's the caveat I would throw at that. But can a person thrive on nothing but the muscle, meat, and associated fat of, let's say, beef? Yes, without any question. Well, let's talk more about that microbiome change. You have my interest peak now. Say somebody's coming from a standard American diet, transitioning to 80% beef plus, and taking on more of a carnivore-ish diet, classic thinking would say, okay, I'm not getting all that fiber from plants. I'm having more meat now. My microbiome, a lot of it is probably going to suffer. Take me through that process of, of weeks there, like you said, that transition phase, and what's happening in the microbiome? The food supply transiting through your elementary canal, through your colon, is where this microbiome largely get their food from. And your dietary makeup is what it is. You as a person, any person's. Therefore, the speciation, the prevalence, the peaceable arrangement of all sorts of different species of microbiota in your colon is based on that food supply. The ones that are getting what they need most prevail most. The ones that don't get the, what they want will exist in the background and be like the mammals were while, while the dinosaurs were around, for example. Um, and then you suddenly change your diet, let's say, overnight. Now, the bacteria and other small organisms that are expecting a certain makeup of food are not getting that. They're getting something completely different that's no good for them. They will go to war with each other for the resources that exist such that they are. Some of them will encapsulate themselves and basically go into stasis until conditions improve. Some of them that don't encapsulate, instead of doing that, will eat into the wall of your colon and bury themselves in there. That tends to cause quite a bit of gut upset when beasties basically eat through the lining of your colon and reside in there for a bit. So it's the physical injury, the damage of that having occurred, the inflammatory immune response to that. And if you upset your, your colon in terms of the health of that tissue, that will affect your entire body because there are more nerve endings in your colon than there are anywhere else in your body outside of your brain. And it's... it's an environment which has perhaps the most pervasive effect over a person's overall health status of any other factor. So it's something we need to, to jealously guard and protect. That's why I'm saying change your diet slowly. Let that microbiome adjust to the change in such a way as you're not going to precipitate that all in war that's going to destroy your gut function, sometimes for years, till we can get it back. Um, it's not something you want to go through if you can avoid it. And can you avoid it? Yes, by being a bit sensible.
Okay, take me through the fiber piece. I know this is something you're anti, this whole movement currently where we need to eat a lot of different plants and get a lot of different fiber for the microbiome. Tie that in. So the exact requirement in dietary terms, nutrient terms, for dietary insoluble plant fiber is not one single gram ever. Ever. The so-called um, educated will then say, ah, yes, but there are a whole bunch of beasties that live in our microbiome that rely entirely on fiber. What they do is they basically ferment some of the fiber that you consume and in so doing release some short-chain fatty acid and that short-chain fatty acid is crucial for the functioning of your enteric cells in your colon, the cells that line your colon wall. And if you don't eat the fiber, these cells will be dysfunctional and there'll be a problem and you'll get bowel cancer and all of this kind of nonsense. When you actually then analyze that statement, it sounds feasible, doesn't it? It's like, oh, well, okay, that makes sense. Until you look at this thing and go, okay, well, the short-chain fatty acid that we're talking about it's being released by the fermentation of a very small amount of the fiber that we actually eat. What is that short-chain fatty acid? Do you know, Jesse? I just know it as a short-chain fatty acid. I'll give you the name I don't, of it. Yeah, nothing, nothing further. I'll give you the name of the, the major form of short-chain fatty acid produced in your colon by fermenting fiber. It's called butyric acid. B-U-T-R-O. Can't even spell butyric acid. <laughs> um, it's the same acid that you'll find in butter. Hence, butter is called butter, butyric acid. Okay. It's also the same fatty acid that you'll find provided on the other side of the lumen by ketone bodies, beta hydroxy butyrate. And in fact, if you take up butyric acid on the lumen side of the colon from fermentation of fibers or from butter, that butyric acid that you consume, the first metabolic step in making it useful so that we can use it for anything is to transmute it into beta-hydroxybutyrate, a ketone body. So this requirement for fiber for butyric acid, no, either eat butter or be in ketosis or both. Problem solved. I've eaten ostensibly no fiber to speak of for about nine years now. So I should be well and truly stopped up and I should be absolutely full of colon cancer by now, shouldn't I? After nine years of ignoring this fact that we all need fiber, hasn't happened. So either I'm some kind of superhuman, as well as the hundreds of thousands, and now probably millions, it seems, of people following this lifestyle, the carnival lifestyle. Not one of them is running around saying, oh, it's terrible. I, I died within months, they say. They don't, because they haven't. <laughs> so it's just it's an idea that's had its time. It's a hypothesis that is being offered up to people as a fact, and it's not a fact. It's a theory. It's an ideology. It's a theology. It's false. You don't need any fiber at all. In fact, fiber is, if anything, disruptive to enteric function. Uh, fiber is actually the cause of most issues that people have in their guts, precisely because your gut is not designed to break down fibers. Your gut is designed to absorb amino acids and fatty acids, some sugars. So as somebody is going through this transition period and including more meat, less fiber, talk more specifically about what they can expect with bowel movements. Mm. Not that it's necessarily a problem, but are there changes that they should know? Yeah. There's quite a range of how people can react during the transition period. Some people will get transiently stopped up. They'll get constipated for maybe a week or two, which is 
reversible if needs be. There are steps we can take to get things moving if we have to. Sometimes they'll get loose. So the exact opposite. It just depends on what's happening in their microbiome, how it's reacting to it, and how those microbiota are dealing with their stuff to come to a new, peaceable, happy arrangement. Um, some people will notice absolutely nothing in terms of their bowel function. However, maybe they get skin breakouts. Maybe they get hair and nail issues for a month or two. Maybe they get brain fog. Maybe they get energetic issues. Maybe they get inflammatory issues around joints and things. All sorts, because anything whatsoever can happen in your body in response to something perceived as negative happening in, in the colon. So when, when you sort of say, well, what can people expect? Well, anything, to be fair. What we do find universally is the way to minimize any diversion away from ideal function, happiness, and health, even for a short period, is, as I say, to do this transition of changing your food across slowly, six weeks minimum. And then there'll be the person who changes their diet overnight, says, oh, it was fantastic, everything came right within a week, and I had no problems whatsoever, to which we say, well, congratulations, you're a superhuman. Most people have issues. And then for most people, when they get to the end of that six weeks and they've transitioned, can they expect regular bowel movements, or will it be less frequent without plants? Absolutely. Um, we find that volume goes down of number twos. So they get skinnier, they get smaller, there's less of them. Instead of going once a day, sometimes more than once a day for some people, you'll find once every second or third day is quite normal. That's not to say still continuing to go every day is abnormal, because now after, well, really nine, just over nine years, I'm regular to the point of once a day, every day, set your clock to it, one and done, no stress, no strain, no pushing, no difficulty of any kind, lay a rope, we're out of here within several minutes. Sorry for the details, but that's what we're talking about. Absolutely no issue with bowel function whatsoever. On a zero carbohydrate, basically, zero fiber, basically, diet. I'll tell you what, though, when I do go off piste because I'm a human being and do something stupid, that's when the bowel function falls to bits again for a day or two. And I go, oh, well, that's probably because I had that X, Y, or Z. What would it be for you when you do fall off track? I'm quite partial to beer. Um, I don't mind a potato chip. Um, occasionally, I've been known to do something as crazy as eat a small amount of pizza or something like that. And I'm pretty good these days, though, mostly because the longer you're actually on a clean 100% carnival diet, the more violently your body reacts when you do go off piste. So it becomes just not even worth it. And a lot of people think, well, that, if, if that's the problem with it then. You don't have that flexibility anymore. And I say, well, you can see that as a problem, if you like, or you can actually look at it as a bonus. You can say, you know, this is your body encouraging you very, very firmly to do the right thing consistently. That's maybe a good thing. Oh, yeah, but blah, 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 whatever, you know. And it comes down to this thing I often say to people, which is you need to understand the reason that you eat food is so that you might live. It is not the other way around. You know, a bit of discipline is all it takes. Until your body gets used to that, then it's quite happy with that. You go off piste and it goes, don't do that, Charlie Brown. I think it's a good thing. So when somebody finds themselves arriving at whatever diet is right for them, say they're 80% meat or beyond, any supplements that they can take at that point to complement that? Or it sounds like, and you've said, somebody can thrive just on beef, muscle meat. How do you feel about supplementing on top of that to get additional benefits? Nutritional supplementation, vitamins, minerals, certain amino acids, things like that, 
are an individual decision that a person makes on the basis that they believe for some reason that they have a deficiency in that particular thing, perhaps, or maybe they're viewing it as an insurance policy so that they don't, whatever. The facts of the matter are very clear. There is no nutritional deficiency a person can expect to experience on a diet consisting of nothing other than the muscle meat associated fat, perhaps a bit of butter, some salt, not one single deficiency that a person can expect to experience. That's not to say a person won't. There may be other factors that might cause a person to be not so good at retaining some of these, mostly electrolytes, it seems, is the big issue that someone's going to have if they do carnivore wrong, like if they pile in heaps and heaps of liver, Paul Saladino for example, or if they consume an insufficient bolus of protein in one meal a day and instead split their protein into three or four or five meals a day, Paul Saladino, or don't take in enough total protein for their particular body size and activity level, age, stage, etc., Paul Saladino. Those kind of things can happen. Um, But a person that does it sensibly according to the natural design of things, according to their genetic gift, their anthropological past, will not experience a problem. There are no supplements that will universally be required or perhaps even be associated with with definite benefit. But if a person swears by something, fine, who am I to be grosser than that? So long as it's not something that's going to cause a toxicity issue, like copper absolutely will, for example. Um, personally, I am associated with, I have a business relationship with one company and one company only that produces a product which is touted to be a supplement. I tend not to refer to it as a supplement because it really isn't. It's a thing that we call a nutraceutical. And a nutraceutical is not really a, a nutrition supplement and not really a pharmaceutical. So it's a nutraceutical, if that makes sense. It's a thing that has a specific effect on the human body, which is definitely beneficial, no question. The particular thing I'm involved with is a product which is an adult stem cell release agent. There's no nutrition to speak of in the product. There's a little bit of, they put in a few vitamins and minerals and things because you know what these companies are like. And I can't convince them to take those things out of it because they don't need to be there. I'm interested in that product and I, and I promote and um, suggest to everybody that they should be on that product because of what it does. It, it causes your bone marrow to release your adult stem cells and those adult stem cells then go around your circulation, find tissues in your body that are in need of renewal or repair of any kind and they do exactly that. They replace your tissues with brand new ones. Isn't that fantastic? That's awesome. Um, that's the only product that I promote to my people at all. People say, oh, what about vitamin C though? Nope, not required. On a carnivore diet, there's perfectly sufficient vitamin C in the diet. What, in muscle meat? Yes. But it says zero on the label. Yes, that's because it's below a certain threshold where they're allowed to write zero. Doesn't mean it is zero. And in fact, your need for vitamin C is vastly reduced if you're not also eating carbohydrate. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the transporter that means that you can absorb vitamin C from the blood into the cells is a transporter called GLUT4. Ever heard of that one? I have. Glucose. Mm, That's the one that transports glucose, isn't it? So if you're piling glucose down your stupid neck multiple times a day, every day of your life, and you have elevated blood glucose, as you will have in that case, then vitamin C needs to work so much harder by way of concentration in the blood to get into your cells because it's two fat men trying to get through a revolving door at once, if you like. Remove one of those fat men, and the other one will go through fine. So get rid of sugar, and the vitamin C goes in, and you don't need a huge amount of it. Because again, you know there are millions of people who are eating a carnivore diet. Some of us have been doing it for multiple decades. I can think of well, the, the two longest examples I know of are a bloke in the States called Rick Rodriguez, who's been carnivore for over 40 years, 4-0. Four 
And there's a lady called Maggie who's a rancher, I think in Texas somewhere, who has been carnivore for I think 67 years. And neither one of them is dead from scurvy. So what, what gives? Either the theory is wrong or those two are both superhumans. But then you look across all the other carnivals and go, well, okay, are the rest of us all dead from scurvy within six weeks? Oh, must be wrong. All right, to make sure I have this right, because this is something people talk about, the vitamin C. So vitamin C and glucose, they both share the GLUT4 transporter into the cell. So if you're consuming glucose and you're not getting enough vitamin C, you're going to run into problems. The little bit that's in meat will be able to get into the cell and give you what you need without glucose. So the problem is when you're getting low in carbohydrates and you're trying to rely on meat for that vitamin C. Yes. So if you eat meat for vitamin C and carbohydrates that don't contain vitamin C, so let's say your diet is meat and bread, then you're going to get scurvy. Yes. Because the carbohydrate from the bread will outcompete the small amount of vitamin C from the meat and it won't be able to get into your cells and you will get scurvy at some point. Yes. Take the bread out of that situation altogether, double up on your meat intake. Now you've got enough vitamin C because the, the glucose transporter, the thing that we call the glucose transporter, the GLUT4, is not busy transporting glucose. So it's ready to accept and transport vitamin C at, at the drop of a hat and does so. All right, while we're talking about vitamin C, let's get into iron. This is another one that I know is a myth, but I want to talk about what's happening there. Somebody with you know conventional thinking would assume, and rightfully so, given the conventional information, that if you consume red meat as a carnivore and you're having tons of that every day, you're going to have iron issues. So talk about what goes on in the body to compensate for that. Well, number one, tons of meat every day would be impossible. I know that's just a turn of phrase, but let's be let's be realistic about what what it is. Now, I'm not a huge individual. I'm five foot six, I'm 140 pounds dripping wet. So I don't need as much food as say Sean Baker. Sean's got 100 pounds on me, plus. So he eats a lot more meat than I do, but it's still relative to his body size. What I'm always promoting to people as a good starting point is, your minimum protein intake per day ought to be 1.75 grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass. Now, Americans will need to transmute those figures into pounds and whatever else to make it work. So they'll need to do some math, but it's not too hard. That's the minimum. And we go up to a, perhaps 1.5 times that. That'll be your sweet spot individually. And it's dependent on your age, your gender, your body size, your activity level, your training status, your stress and distress in your life, etc. That will affect all of that. But you'll, you'll hit on what the right level is over that time. So that's more meat than most people will eat on a mixed standard diet. Absolutely. But it's not tons. Example, I would eat uh, less than a pound a day, well and truly less than a pound of meat. And um, Sean Baker, around about two pounds, give or take, whatever it is, just for two examples of two relatively prominent carnivals that we know about. Dr. Anthony Chafee, I think, eats a similar amount to what um, Sean Baker does, but he's a similar sort of body size as well. He's another six foot plus muscled, you know, bloke in his in his thirties, as it turns out, for Anthony Chafee. Um, age also comes into how much meat you need, by the way. So both Sean and I are past fifty, so we would need less than Anthony Chafee would, for example. Whatever. So this this idea with iron problems. Which iron problems do you mean? I mean. Just you hear that if you're to consume a carnivore diet in the health space, again, I'm being very vague here, but I don't have specific examples, that you're going to accumulate too much iron in the body and cause issues. Right. Okay. So 
there are a couple of very interesting points there. Number one, the exact form of iron that is required by the human body to have biological use, to be usable by the human body at all, is a form of iron which is biocollated to a protein called heme, H-E-M-E. Heme iron is what you need. And why do we need that? Well, its primary role is in the carriage and capacitance for oxygen in your body. Heme iron is completely, absolutely, and utterly non-toxic. Precisely because it is protected by the way it's carried around the body by the proteins that it's biocollated to. They encapsulate the thing. They package the thing in such a way that it can be stored long-term in your body for use when it's needed in a encapsulated, safe, non-leaky, non-problematic binding, if you like. The other way that we can get iron into our bodies is through non-heme iron, the kind of iron that you'll find in plant foods, for example. That is toxic, highly toxic, and that absolutely will cause you a problem. Heme iron will not. The only thing that these people point to when they're talking about, oh, heme iron's a problem, heme iron's a problem, is they're looking at associative studies where they follow large populations of people by way of respondent survey returns. So they don't measure anything. They don't keep these people in labs. They don't keep them under control. These people are free living under their own recognizance for multiple decades. And every few years they get sent a, um, a questionnaire that they fill out. So that's the first problem. Write this down. People tell lies about what they've been eating and how often, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, if we take 100,000 people, 200,000 people, or a million people, and equate the incidence of, for example, various cancers with their reported intake of heme iron, we might get this really quite weak associative relationship between those factors. It really is very, very weak, by the way. Now, talk about how statistically significant this finding is. This is their propaganda. This is how they sell their bill of goods. Yes, it is statistically significant. Statistical significance is determined by the sample size more often than anything else. The larger your sample size, the smaller an effect can be before it statistically happened due to anything other than dumb chance, parsimoniously. So you can have this minuscule effect and say, look how statistically significant that is. P equals 0 0.00000. Well, that's very meaningful. Ergo, my case has been made. But then you look back and you, and you trace it back and you go, well, what does that actually mean in practice? The baseline incidence for these kind of cancers they're talking about in the populations that they generally look at generally tends to run at around about 8 per 10,000 person years of follow-up at baseline in the zero intake of this nasty meat-based poison somehow. They sometimes find maybe a 25, maybe 30% difference in the incidence of cancer at the high end of meat intake. So that equates to a difference of less than two per 10,000 years of follow-up for any given individual. Now, given that a human lifespan is, let's say, 100 years, we would need to divide that 2 per 10,000 down to per 100 years to find out what the difference in risk is for that individual, wouldn't we? If that was a cause and effect relationship, which it is not, because of the milieu of uncontrolled covariates, confounds, collinearities, healthy user bias, unhealthy user bias, all these things that affect a person's hard-baked outcomes in their life. Do they get cancer or do they not get cancer over the next 10 years in the study, for example? So what we have is a weak 
weak association with no real meaning for any one given living human being over a 100-year lifespan, which we're going to call statistically significant in order to sell it to people, and we're going to assume by lack of a statement to the contrary that this associative data set is cause and effect, which it isn't. It's utter nonsense. It's pseudoscience. It's crock pottery of the highest order. It's actually criminal that these people are basically putting these studies forward, and they're doing it for two reasons. One, because in academia there's a thing called publish or perish, whereby you need to publish a number of articles every year as an academic, otherwise you might not get continued the next year. Your professorship is, your ongoing professorship while you're working in academia is dependent on your outputs of research articles. So you need to publish something. So collect some data up, describe your data in a frankly um, criminal and um, and very, very misleading manner to sell it to people and make it really important. And then go back to the source of funding that you got for your study because science costs money to do. So you need to get funding from somewhere. Who has money, by the way? Oh, that's right. Industry has money. And what does industry do in the food area? That's right. They want to sell you things. So who is it that's likely to fund a study where we're going to say red meat causes cancer? Well, it's going to be the wheat growers, isn't it? And when I say the wheat growers, what I actually mean by that is big agriculture, not just wheat, all the various plant crops that people grow for so-called food for people. And those guys, by the way, own the dietetics associations outright, if you follow the money. So they basically own the education of so-called nutrition, so-called professionals. And so we get this hymn sheet that we're all singing off, or they're all singing off, whereby they're all saying these things like, oh, look, statistically significant association between red meat consumption and cancer. Ergo, you're left to assume that that means you shouldn't eat red meat. No. There's no evidence for that. It's ridiculous. It's laughable. Anyway, there you go. Long answer, but that's what it is. Let's come back to the heme iron versus non-heme iron. You mentioned non-heme in plants is toxic. I want to come back to that in a sec. But we have the heme in meat. If we are consuming more, though, does the body have a system? You mentioned it's non-toxic, but does the body have a system to get rid of that? Or does it just like the fact that it's getting more on that carnivorous diet? Yeah. The, the human body will store things that it can store without doing itself too much mischief, I guess like heme iron and those kind of things, things that um, that need to be stored for a rainy day. In the natural course of events, we would also store excess foods as fat, foods that we don't need right now that we've taken in because we could get it. However, I challenge you to find a cave painting of a fat caveman. They lived very differently. They had very different lifestyles. We've changed our lifestyles hugely, markedly, unrecognizably over the last even 100, 150 years, which in terms of genetic drift is an absolute flash in the pan. There's no way our genes could react quickly enough to optimize our health based on our current lifestyle. And that's why it hasn't happened. That's why... We're getting fatter, we're getting sicker, more and more diabetes, more and more cancer, more and more heart disease. It's because we're eating a diet that is completely un- inappropriate for us as a species, and the lifestyles that we're living are also completely inappropriate for us in terms of our genes and the speciation that we are. And it's going to be you know, a good number of generations before we get back to any kind of equilibrium, I would suggest. Let's come back to the non heme now. Say somebody is on a vegan diet, they're not getting the heme iron, they're getting the non-heme iron, which is toxic, which I want you to explain more about. What happens in the body? Okay, well, You explain the five-year thing where vegans can sometimes get away with it. Does the iron relate to that at all? Sure. I mean, the iron toxicity plays a part 
in the various problems that vegans typically experience. It's not the be-all and end-all, it's not the answer by itself. The kind of toxicity I'm talking about is that iron can act both as an oxidant and an antioxidant, depending on other circumstances. So non-heme iron can be highly oxidating, highly damaging to human tissues if it's not encapsulated in the heme, for example. Too much iron can be neurotoxic. Too much iron can cause other electrolyte imbalances at the level of the kidney, for example. Um, in, in a very, very severe circumstance of iron toxicity, obviously that person will die. It will, it will kill that person. Very, very rare for that to occur, but it, it's not unheard of. The human body can transmute a small amount of non-heme iron into heme iron by biocalating that itself with its own manufactured heme, but the human capacity to do so is very, very low. And it just makes absolutely no sense to attempt to get the iron in the form that you need it by consuming iron in a form that's completely unlike the, the, what you need, basically. So it's neurotoxicity, it's, it's uh, hepatic toxicity, really. It's um, cardiac toxicity as well. It's, it's oxidative damage that can occur. It's, it's not a good idea to load your body up with non-heme iron at all. Let's stick on this vegan piece here for a bit. And we're coming up on the new year here. Say somebody starting January 1st decides for their health, for the planet, for ethics, they're going to adopt a vegan diet. Let's talk about the changes in the body over that five-year period. Say somebody is going from a standard type diet to a vegan diet. And then over five years, the depletion that they'll have and some of the consequences they'll have because of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, a person that decides on veganism for health reasons is misguided. Veganism will not long-term improve your health. It will short-term if you've come from a standard diet. Say three to five years is what it seems to be. After which, your health will catastrophically fail you at some point. Because of the vast destitution of nutrient required by human beings inherent in that dietary practice. Typically, on average, a vegan becomes unable to maintain any meaningful muscle mass. Now, there are one or two vegans out there taking gear, being bodybuilders on a vegan diet, saying, look, I'm a, I'm a vegan bodybuilder. Well, I'll tell you what, Charlie Brown, any extra musculature that you do have there is not to do with your diet so much. It's to do with the fact that you're taking gear. For example, there are also carnivores doing the same thing, by the way. So I'm not saying it's particular to vegans. So you'll have a loss of muscle mass. I mean, just go and have a look at some of these vegan promoters who've been doing this for a num any number of years. And what you will generally see is pencil necks, caved in skulls, caved in eye sockets, empty cheeks, lack of pallor, like ashen color sometimes even you know, heading towards blue or translucent, um, you'll find a deadness in the eyes, you'll find a lack of alertness, you'll find a lack of apparent energy. You'll find that they all speak with the same intonation. For some, oh, That's probably a cultural thing more than anything else. Um, they'll have skin problems, generally nail problems, hair problems, says me. Um, they'll have um, slow injury healing if they're getting injured doing anything, whatever, if they've even got enough energy to do anything that could get them injured, you know. Constant infections. Yeah, all sorts of – basically these are people who are death warmed up waiting to cool down precisely because – I mean, I actually refer to veganism as the church of anorexia vegana because it really is exactly that. It is totally inappropriate to attempt to get nutrition from plants. 
that will not work well long term. So that's kind of where it is. So will it support your health long term? No, it will not. Is veganism better for the planet? Absolutely not under any circumstances. It's vastly, hugely worse in terms of environmental impact, numbers of associated cause and effect animal deaths, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is absolutely no rational argument that can say that a vegan diet is better for the environment than a meat-based diet. just does not work. And thirdly, if they're saying I'm doing this for ethical reasons, once again, you're mistaken because what you're doing is destroying your health. That's not ethical. You're misguiding everyone you're talking to about how great veganism is and telling them they should do the same thing. That's not ethical. You are causing more damage to the environment than a 100% carnivore is, absolutely demonstrably without any question. So that's not ethical. And you're, you're claiming that overall this is better for the environment, which is nonsense. Example, any plate of plant-based slop that might be something like food, but not to a human being, that these vegans eat every day, multiple times a day in fact, has plant materials shipped, flown, and bought in from all corners of the earth, having been grown in monocrop, monocrop destructive you know, death areas, really, to destroy the natural environment. I, because of the amount of meat I eat, would eat the equivalent of about one adult cow a year. And guess where that cow grew up? I can see the next one right now. It's about 10 yards from where I'm sitting. I'm looking out the window, and it's eating the grass on my lawn, through the fence because for some reason the grass is greener on my lawn than it is in its paddock. So the air miles on that beef when it's time for that beef to be food for me is not very many, is it? The home kill people come in, they kill the animal, they butcher it up for us, the farmer that owns that cow gets most of it, and because we live here we get to share in some of that. That's awesome. When we, go and ha when we have to go and buy meat, which we still do, we drive half an hour or so to a butcher that sources all their meat from the region here. And it's, it's all beef that's been grown on grass, that grass being grown by rain. They're not irrigated, and we don't really need to irrigate so much here. Because, again, we've got good grass, we've got good rainfall levels, and that, you know... The environmental impact of that is basically none. In fact, cattle uh, is the very thing that makes grasslands viable as, as a habitat and as a way of upgrading unusable protein to usable protein for humans. Let's come back to the nuances of your diet. You mentioned half a pound of either beef or meat per day. Is it beef or meat in general? Generally, it's beef, around 80%. Um, now, I should be careful with these numbers. I'm talking about about 450 grams, which is probably just short of a pound, isn't it? Okay. So more than half a pound, because a half pound doesn't yes. seem like a lot. Like a no, it's more like a pound for someone my size, and someone like Sean Baker is more like two pounds Okay, in a sitting. When will you have that? Will you have it all in one meal? Yeah, I do, personally. I eat once a day, and it's generally at about four o'clock in the afternoon. And then the next time I eat will be four o'clock the next day. No breakfast, no lunch per se, no evening meal per se, unless I'm doing something special where there's an evening meal, in which case I might not have my afternoon feed because I don't want to overdo it. Okay. So when it comes to the timing of that meal being in the afternoon and having one meal a day, typically, is that for health benefits or is that for convenience? Is that for just when you get hungry? Yeah. Okay. So when you get really used to the carnivore lifestyle, you're not getting hungry multiple times a day. The reason a person generally gets hungry multiple times a day is because of poor blood sugar control. And the poor blood sugar control is traceable directly 
99.9% of the time to eating the wrong thing, carbohydrates and plants. For example, don't do that and your blood sugar is very, very stable throughout the 24 hours. So you're not hungry. So you'll get the highest, well, possibly the highest peak of your blood sugar is the morning phenomenon that everybody experiences regardless of your diet. In the morning when the first rays of sunlight hit your body or just before, you will get an increase. Excuse me if you can hear my little puppy going off. So I'll get just got the visitor to the house, but, you know, whatever. So in the morning, you'll get a spike in your blood glucose. That's normal. That's natural. 100, 120 sometimes, fine. And then it settles down for the day. And then obviously when I eat, my blood sugar will go up and then it will drift down over the next 24 hours with the next morning phenomenon thrown in as well, sort of as, as a nuance. My blood glucose would not deviate more than 30 or 40 units throughout a 24-hour period. It's very, very stable. I don't have huge peaks. I don't have troughs. As, I mean, And the thing that will drive someone hunger-wise will be a trough. And do you know or do you think you're in ketosis 24-7? Um, nope. I don't think a person should be in ketosis 24-7. I think that's a bad idea, in fact. That will tend to impact your metabolic rate, your thyroid function, your kidney function, all in a negative way. People who talk about wanting to be in ketosis and stay in ketosis all the time, that's an error. That's another theological standpoint, another position that's often promoted by people who simply do not know what they are talking about. It's not a good idea. Um, a human is designed to drift in and out of ketosis during a 24-hour period where what you get is in the four to six hours postprandially after your meal, your one meal, you won't be in ketosis, obviously. Your body absorbs all of that nutrients, petitions it off, sends it where it needs to go, does its thing. Maybe then the blood pressure, the blood pressure, the blood sugar starts to drop slightly over the next... 10, 12 hours. So by the end of the next 10 to 12 hours, probably just before your morning phenomenon is where, you, where your ketone level will be the highest, I would suspect. But in my case, if I'm going to use one of those stupid stick things, by the way, don't waste your money on those things, people. Don't chase ketones. Don't test your ketones. It will not tell you anything worthwhile knowing. But mine generally remains steadfastly in the pink and never gets as high as purple, unless I'm fasting for several days at a time. And that's normal. That's the body doing what it's supposed to do. It provides the ketones when the blood sugar drops below a certain set point because you haven't eaten for 12, 14, 16 hours. Let's talk more about the details of that period. I think you said it was about four to six hours after the meal, you would be kicked out of ketosis. Is that due to the protein and gluconeogenesis? Because, yes. got it. Okay. Explain that more because some people, I feel like in the carnivore world who are having quote unquote, no carbs feel like they're, I feel like they say they're in ketosis all the time. Mm, okay. The human body has several tissues that absolutely require glucose to function. If you were to remove all the glucose from your circulation from your blood, all the glucose that's stored in your muscles, all the glucose that's stored in your liver, drain your body of glucose, you will die within about four and a half minutes from that point. Your brain requires glucose to run. It will not run without glucose. You will die. That's the argument that a lot of these ill-educated people or people who actually are educated enough to know better, but no, you're not, most people, will try and fool you with. Ah, so your brain needs glucose. Without glucose in your brain, you're going to die, so you better eat some glucose, obviously, is what they'll say. That completely ignores the fact that the human body is capable of making all the glucose it needs itself from non-glucose precursors. These precursors are the glycerol backbones from triacylglycerol molecules, fat molecules. So a, a fat molecule is a glycerol with three fatty acid chains off it. 
We use the fatty acid chains for energy. The glycerol is left behind. What are we going to do with that? We can turn that into sugar. Cool. Um, lactate produced mostly through muscle metabolism, but not entirely through muscle metabolism, but there's, there's a level of lactate that's in your blood at all times. If that level of lactate starts to build up, then your body is more than capable of using that lactate to form sugar, for example. And a third example of one of these non-glucose precursors is there are several of the amino acids that make up proteins that can readily be transmuted into glucose as well. So if you're eating a diet that is devoid of carbohydrates, and when I say devoid, we need to be careful because even meat contains some carbohydrate. The fact that it says zero on the label just means it's less than one gram per 100, and so on the label they're allowed to write zero, ostensibly zero, but there is some carbon meat. Okay, But let's say you're eating very, very little carbohydrate. You, you, you still need to maintain a certain level of glucose in your blood so that your brain can function, so your body has to make that glucose. And it'll make it from the glycerol backbones from fat molecules, and it will make it from protein. And it makes enough that we're going to be kicked out of ketosis. Yeah. If you eat a reasonable bolus of food in one meal a day, if you split the same amount of food into three or four meals, you might not get the same response. And you might struggle. Got it. That's important nuance there. And you're saying if somebody were to do that, they may stay in ketosis, which wouldn't be a good thing. Possibly. Let's talk about the fat in meat. You've touched on this before, but I want to come back to it. We talked about it when we were talking about the venison versus the cow and venison being a leaner meat. Talk about how you look at that when it comes to purchasing meat, getting enough fat. And in, do you ever worry about getting too much or does the body regulate that? Once you've been on a carnivore diet for any reasonable period of time, let's say six months onwards, your instincts in terms of hunger and satiety become highly tuned to exactly how much meat and fat you need. And your body will give you the signal by way of feeling hungry for those things. You will eat those things. And then at some point, suddenly your brain gives you a message saying, I feel quite full now. I think that's enough. All you need to do is listen. Put the fork down when you get that. I'm full now. Even if there's like two mouthfuls left on the plate, don't force that into your body. You put the fork down. You say, I'm full now. And you come back and eat those two mouthfuls later when you are hungry again. Because in some houses, when you put little bits of meat in the fridge, they're still there when you look for them. Not this house. But sometimes, because sometimes, we've got two small dogs that they don't know how to open the fridge. So I wonder how that happens. Hmm. It's not me, by the way. Anyway, so most, mostly our dogs get raw, completely raw meat and organs and bones because they're genetically designed for that. Um, humans are more designed for cooked meat, so that's what we eat. Anyway, um, those, those instincts are powerful. Those instincts are good. Those instincts are very, very accurate. The one sure thing you can do to throw those instincts off and to destroy your ability to know how much food you need and to monitor it, that is adding carbohydrates or plant materials to your diet. That messes up all of that signaling. The people that overeat, which is anybody who, who has any significant amount of stored body fat at all, that is due to overeating, and that overeating is almost invariably due to eating the wrong thing, thus interfering with the signaling. Because again, if we go back to the, the paintings on the walls of caves, you, you don't see people standing around with calculators. That's not what we see on the cave painting walls at all. The other thing you don't see is a picture of any salad, by the way. Just an interesting side, you know, side note. Um, of course, we don't really need those anecdotes at all because the stable isotope testing of long bones of human remains of all ages that have been found anywhere around the world all tell the same story as to what humans ate. It's meat and fat, by the way, not plants. 
He talked about salt before. Talk about the importance of that. Is it just for taste or are you getting certain minerals through that or electrolytes? And talk about quality. Does that matter? Because there's, you know, classic table salt and then there's these different sea salts and Mm -hmm. all different stuff out there these days. So the importance of salt for health and how much does quality matter? Okay. You need a certain amount of salts, electrolytes in your body that do various different roles. If your body drops below that level of those electrolytes, then its function becomes impaired in some way to some level, up to and including death. You can die very, very quickly from having insufficient electrolytes. The same is true as if you have too many electrolytes in your body. That can just as quickly cause you dysfunction up to and including death. Example, I have personally stopped a number of hearts from beating in one of my professional career lines that I did for a while as a younger man. I used to be the bloke in operating theatres for open heart surgery that would push the button to stop the heart so the surgeon could do the heart surgery on the heart-lung trans um, bypass machine. The drug that we use to stop a person's heart from beating, the drug, is hypertonic potassium. That's all it is. Water with potassium ions dissolved in it. Pump in hypertonic potassium into someone's body and that will stop their muscles from contracting, including the heart. So that's one way that you, that you can do that. Luckily, in the normal course of events, people don't consume anything like that kind of level of potassium or any of the other electrolytes that can cause various problems. You will take in generally a small amount, which your genetics are programmed to seek out for taste. That's why you. That's why that stuff tastes good because you're supposed to get it. Um. But you'll find that putting too much salt on something makes it inedible, doesn't it? You don't want that anymore. Putting too much salt in your water makes it undrinkable. You wouldn't do that. So again, it's your instincts looking after you, telling you what you do need. Um, There are many, many indications that ancient humans used to find salt licks around the place. Take them home and um, 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 right now let's eat this meat whatever, and then thought, oh, maybe we should smash it up smaller and sprinkle it. Well, that works too. Now we have grinders that do the same thing. But a lot of people saying, oh, adding salt to our food is a modern thing. Absolute nonsense. No, it isn't. Rubbish. (laughs) People say all sorts of things that suit their ideology, don't they? It's, uh, yeah. So you absolutely need a certain level of salt in your diet to maintain the right level. You also need good, healthy, functioning kidney tissue that basically maintains the level of those things by pumping ions across the membrane, both into and out of urine, so that you've got the right amount in your blood. Um, you've got the instinct of wanting it for taste. That's too much. It, 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 it's you know, it's almost as if humans have been evolving and living and doing reasonably well on the planet for 350,000 years and more like four and a half million in species very similar to our current speciation, but not quite yet human. We've been doing it a long, long time. Mm. In terms of quality, really, there there are really only three major electrolytes that exist in a human body in enough concentration that you would need to worry about it per se. Sure, a person can get deficiencies on some of the very much more trace minerals and things, um, in which case, on a case-by-case basis, if a person shows signs of that and we can identify that there is a shortage of that, then we might supplement with that mineral and probably do some stuff to help them with their kidney function and whatever else to maintain that as well. But the three most important are sodium, potassium, and chloride. So if you take in sodium chloride, table salt, and Epsom salt, 
in a much smaller amount, by the way. So maybe three or four to one in terms of the ratio of sodium chloride to Epsom salt, you're covered in terms of the major ones. If you want to make sure you've got all sorts of other things in your body as well at various trace tiny amounts, you might go for something like Celtic or Celtic salt sometimes. Sometimes pink Himalayan salt people use as well. You also need to be aware, however, that there can also be things in those kind of salts that you don't want in your body. Heavy metals, for example, and other toxins as well. Um, How do you feel about iodine in a typical table salt? Well, table salt, I don't know about elsewhere, but in New Zealand, table salt is universally iodized. Here as well, I believe. Okay. So you take in standard table salt and a very small amount of Epsom salt relative to that. You can even mix it up in the same salt shaker if you like, so that it's that's what you're getting. You're going to be covered. And it would be a rare occurrence for you to get an electrolyte disturbance even rarer if you're actually doing the right things by your body, i.e. eating once a day and not three or four times a day, eating food for a human being and not things that are not food for human beings. And that, that's the major parts of that battle won, basically. But if somebody were to do that using iodized salt, would they have to worry about the iodine becoming a problem? Well, for the most part, additional or excess electrolytes can be passed out to the urine at the kidney, thus it exits the body and doesn't accumulate. You have to have one of the major ones out of whack. Now, absolutely, you can get one of the major ones out of whack, knock on effect by getting one of the minor ones out of whack, like copper, for example, that's one we talked about earlier. I'm not aware of there being a significant prevalence or problem with carnivore folks taking an iodized table salt, getting any problem with you know, iodine toxicity. Okay. I'm just curious, being fortified and all, and just depending on how much salt somebody's taking in. I'm not aware of anyone that's that's had a problem. If there is somebody out there that's had a problem with iodine poisoning, please let me know. I want to hear about it. I'll, I'll interview you, and we'll get to the bottom of it. That'll be awesome. But I just don't know of anyone that has had that. So, Bart, even given all the evidence you've given for uh, animal-based or carnivore diet, there's going to be people tuning in today that are going to fall all along the spectrum of vegan to carnivore and a lot of people in between. When it comes to those people in between that are going to have, say, even a high meat diet, but have you know what they consider healthy plants in there, what are some of the biggest offending foods we need to be aware of if we're going to have an omnivore diet? Number one, if you're going to, as Jesse says, if you're going to insist on an omnivore diet, I'm going to get you to sign the disclaimer that says, and so therefore whatever happens is your own damn fault because you should not eat an omnivorous diet. There is no such thing as healthy plant foods. That is an ideology. That is a propaganda that people have been sold for about 100 years by people who have an axe to grind. Okay? Okay. The exact requirement for plant food of any kind in your diet is not one single gram ever. None. At all. That said, the things that you absolutely need to avoid, in my mind, above all else because of the effect of these things, the demonstrable effects of these things, are the top item on the hit list of things to absolutely avoid is any industrial seed oil vegetable oil of any kind if you see it on the supermarket shelf and it's somewhere between clear and straw colored and it's a fluid in a plastic bottle usually can be a glass bottle doesn't matter what sort of bottle it's in by the way if it is liquid at room temperature and an oil you should not consume it in your food neither should you use it for cooking under any circumstances that is the worst thing you can put into your body bar none the second worst thing you can put into your body is sugar or anything that readily turns into sugar, which basically is almost all of the carbohydrates. Ergo, almost 
all of the plant materials. Um, the third, fourth, fifth, it starts to get quite even from that point on. Fiber, contraindicated. It will do your it will do your guts damage. It will destroy your enteric function probably in some way or another. And if it doesn't do that, it will almost certainly lead to a chronic systemic inflammatory overburden. And secondary to chronic systemic inflammation, the likelihood of various disease processes goes up exponentially. Which which diseases? Heart disease, high blood pressure, strokes, cancers, most of them, and dementia. All the big killers of people in Western society before their time all down to inflammation caused by inappropriate carbohydrate and fiber intake. So I'd get those things out of there. The seed of any plant or the extract of seed of any plant, seeds are the most toxic parts of a plant. Obviously, the seed doesn't want you to, well, the the. The plant does want you to eat the seed, but the, the plant wants you to eat that seed whole without chewing it, swallow it, pass it through your digestive system and deposit it somewhere else so it can grow there with the fertilizer that you put there with it. As soon as you chew a seed up, dis- disrupt its physical function, destroy its ability to grow into a plant, it releases toxins to tell you, don't do that. Um, so you, you absolutely want to avoid all seeds, all nuts, all grains, all of those things that can themselves grow into a plant. The leaves and stems of most plants are highly toxic. The least toxic part of most plants are fruits. However, they come with their own set of problems. Fructose, which is highly problematic in its own right. So what we're, what we're left with, basically, what, what we've boiled down to after all of that is if you remove all those really serious problems from your diet, what's left? Meat and animal fat, butter and other dairy items as appropriate to your body. Some people react to dairy well, others don't. Salt. That's about it. Eggs. Eggs are great for a lot of people as well. Eggs are a great source of nutrition. But a lot of people have allergic issues with eggs too. Um, yeah, so so basically, the the rule of thumb is if you want to optimize your lifespan, probably, and your health span, almost definitely, then what you need to do is avoid anything that's a plant or came from a plant, pretty much, or at least vastly minimize that stuff. You are absolutely designed as an obligate hyper carnivore by four and a half, five million years of both positive and negative selection pressures that have molded your body, your systems, your organs in that way. Unequivocally, no question. That's what you should do to optimize your individual odds of having the most healthy and longest life possible. Anything else and you're playing Russian roulette. Let's talk about drinks. Earlier, you said you'd have an occasional beer. A lot of people having a carnivore diet are still having coffee. Water, obviously, filtered water is something that nobody's going to argue isn't necessary for the human physiology. So talk about how you feel about those and other beverages. What an individual person does at any given tick of the clock or across time is their own call, is their own decision, obviously. I wouldn't necessarily sit and listen much to a person that would sit there and say, beer is great for you and you should have some. Other alcoholic beverages are great and fine and innocuous and you should have some. Coffee's awesome. I can't live without my coffee, some people say, which is absolute nonsense. Of course you can. Um, I'm not going to sit in judgment because I too drink coffee. I have the occasional beer or five. I also am a hedonist and have no um, no ability to moderate myself. If I'm going off the wagon, I go off and 
then I suffer for the next 48 hours and swear blind I'll never do it again until next time. But what a person should do ideally is clear. There's no place in the diet for alcoholic beverages, fruit juice of any kind, um, coffee, no place for that. It's a recreational drug and it should be viewed as such. So when I have my sip of my coffee, I am undertaking, having made a determination that it doesn't seem to affect me too negatively at the level that I'm at, and it's my choice to do so. But is it optimal and is it safe and is it... No. A person should not do that. Cheers. As you talked about sugars, carbs, one of the big conversations in the health and wellness space right now is metabolic health. And that journey all the way from what most people ter term insulin resistance all the way to diabetes and beyond, you're not a fan of that term insulin resistance. Talk about how you feel about that. And is that just a naming thing or do you agree with the physiology changes that happen as a person is headed down that path? Right. Okay. There is nuance here. And it's important that people hear what I am saying and don't make up something else that I'm not saying. So listen to me very carefully, people. Insulin resistance in the way that it's couched in the inference of the very term insulin resistance and in the assumption by virtue of there being no statement to the contrary is a fallacy. It's a construct. It's an idea that's been put together. Strictly speaking, is the body in some way resisting the normal function of insulin when someone is insulin resistant? Yes. Absolutely. However, when a person says someone is insulin resistant or they have insulin resistance, the implication, the assumption is that that is a pathological state of being. That is a state of being that will cause you to have a disease process of some kind. Specifically, the disease process that they claim is due to and caused by insulin resistance is an elevation in your blood glucose at rest chronically. Get your blood, your resting blood glucose over a certain threshold level, and the decision is made to diagnose you as being type 2 diabetic. Period. That's all it is. So, what is type 2 diabetes? It is elevated blood glucose, nothing else. Now, when someone's body is not responding to insulin in the way that it normally does or should do, we'll get to that in a minute. That means anytime you consume any amount of carbohydrate, that carbohydrate is more likely to end up pooling in your blood, leading to elevated blood glucose. So that's why they say insulin resistance is the underpinning cause of diabetes, to which I say absolute rubbish. It's nothing of the sort. The cause of diabetes, elevated blood glucose, is pouring things down your stupid neck that readily turn into glucose, i.e., all carbohydrates. You can be as insulin resistant as you like, and if you consume no carbohydrate whatsoever, you will not have elevated blood glucose, ergo you will not be diagnosed as diabetic, because diabetes is elevated blood glucose, nothing whatever to do with insulin. The insulin action that's going on is quite separate from that, although it has an effect when you eat carbohydrates unnecessarily, sure. The insulin resistance is, in fact, not a pathology. It is an adaptive metabolic adjustment optimizing the body to run on the fats that it has stored and available and ready for use. A cell that has locked its doors to the intake of glucose does so precisely because that cell is full of energy. It is replete with usually a droplet of fat. And that fat will last that cell for quite some time. It needs no further energy input at all. And in fact, if 
the glucose we're allowed to pour into that cell according to its concentration gradient in the blood, then the internal workings, the organelles, the, the proteins and things within that cell would become destroyed, as would that cell then become destroyed. So this insulin resistance is not a pathology at all. It is a self-protective mechanism protecting that cell from destruction by glucose. Ergo, the red blood cells and the epithelial cells of the of the vasculature become the, the sacrificial lambs in that case. Luckily, the physiological ability to replace those cells with brand new ones is vastly, vastly more attuned and more rapid than having to replace, say, a muscle cell that you've destroyed from sugar or a heart cell that you've destroyed from sugar or whatever. So that's why your body is doing insulin resistance, because it does not require glucose. Remember, if circling right back to the very beginning, the exact requirement in human physiology in the diet for external exogenous carbohydrates is not one gram ever, zero. So frankly, I couldn't give a rip what someone's insulin status is. Um, I work with people's physiology the way that it's running when, when we get it running optimally, which is to run on fat and not sugar. And then the body will produce as much sugar as it needs for the brain and the testes and several other tissues that need the glucose. The signaling will be done by the level of ketones in the blood according to the rate of ketos, the ketosis at the time and other second messenger like and hormone systems that all act in concert to maintain a person's homeostasis. Insulin resistance is a normal, natural, indicated, and useful biological process. It is not a pathology, and it is not the cause of diabetes, because glucose is the only thing that can cause diabetes to become an evidence, because that's the way it's diagnosed. That's what it is. And that's the pathology, because neither insulin nor fat are toxic in the blood or in the cells at high levels. Sugar is. Okay, talk about how you feel about this period of, say, 10 to 20 years when somebody is becoming metabolically unhealthy before they become type 2 diabetic and testing, say, fasting insulin or using a craft test to see what's happening in that period of time that someone would refer to as insulin resistance to hopefully realize there's a problem, reverse things out, doing the things that we're talking about today, dietary, and hopefully we'll get to other things beyond and finding value in using that term insulin resistance in that case to reverse out before they, you know, cause all kinds of destruction. Okay. My cure, my solution is always the same. Stop eating plants, fibers, carbohydrates, seed oils, manufactured foods, highly processed foods, things with artificial chemicals like food colorings and preservatives and things in them, stop doing that slowly over six to eight weeks. Once you've been doing that for six to eight weeks, here is the ongoing prescription. Keep not eating those things. then you will not have a problem with your blood glucose and your insulin levels become completely irrelevant because diabetes and all its sequelae are caused by elevated blood glucose, not insulin. Okay? And actually, the longer you're on a diet devoid of carbohydrates, the less your insulin activity response is, the less insulin you'll produce. And, in fact, the more what they call metabolically flexible you'll become, actually, you will be able to cope with occasional boluses of carbohydrates better. There is no value or utility in checking someone's insulin resistance status and saying that's of use to us in any way, unless that person is determined that they will not be changing their diet, they will continue to eat the same way. In which case you could say, well, this is clear indication that your body doesn't like that. 
it's setting you up for a problem if you don't change your behavior. And the behavior you need to change is the one that tells you you should eat plant material, carbohydrates, fibers, seed oils, and all that shit. Excuse my French. No, I hear you. But what I'm sure we can both agree upon is there's going to be a very small group of people tuning into this that are going to go all the way 100% carnivore. So I want to make sure we're practical for everybody. Part of that being, how do you feel about somebody? Let's talk about the continuum of somebody who say having 80% meat. I think you mentioned that's kind of your typical 90% meat, 100% meat. Talk about the different benefits somebody gets being in that continuum of an animal-based diet, but say if they're not going 100%. As I say, I run at 90 to 95% across time, across any given year. I have had quite remarkable, quite incredible improvements in my health status by doing that for roughly nine years. That said, there have been a couple of periods where for a challenge, for a series of videos, for the promotion of some work that someone's doing, whatever, as part of my social media influences thing, I have done a couple of periods of 100% absolute complete adherence, no plant material of any kind. One of those was 30 days and one of those was 90 days. In the 30-day example, my health improved probably half again from what my baseline is, which is pretty good. So what I'm saying is that 5 to 10% extra in 30 days netted me as much health on top again, completely unreasonably out of whack of what's you'd expect. Or you can look at that the other way and say a very small transgression of 5 to 10% is associated with a 50% pen penalty against the health status. Again, completely unreasonable. But at the end of the day, this is not something that you can negotiate with. It is what it is. The trick for any given young player, or even older player, is to get on board with this. Understand that that is so. Not try and negotiate your way out of that, because you can't. When I did 90 days, 100% carnivore, it was more like a doubling of my health status in 90 days. And it was the same 5 to 10% over a slightly longer period. The health increase of that very small reduction of that transgression, completely out of proportion. It was stunning. It was amazing. To which people say, well, why didn't you just keep doing that then? Why did you go back to 95%? Well, because I'm a human being, I'm a hedonist, I lack self-discipline, and 90 to 95% is a level that I can maintain and be happy with without distress and, you know, all of that. There are others who say, I'm 100%, I'm never going back to anything but 100%, this is not difficult, I love this, why would I do anything different? To which I say, congratulations, I wish... I wish that was my personality as well, but it isn't. Now, you might pick 80%, in which case you're probably going to get really not a huge amount of benefit. There'll be some. Absolutely, there'll be some. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. If that's all you can achieve in your life with your personality, we'll take you there. Let's start there and see if we can move you closer to 100 by going through short periods of time where you experiment with it and go, well, that really is incredible. Now, could I maintain this? I know it was a 30-day challenge, a 90-day challenge, but could I just keep doing this? And hopefully you're stronger than me and you go, yes, I could. Okay. Earlier when we were talking about insulin resistance, you touched on the fact that cells can lock the door from inside and the damage of the red blood cells and the endothelium. So you started to creep into the Randall cycle, which is an area I really want to dig into with you because you're a real expert and you have a great way of breaking that down. So take us to the beginning of what that is 
and walk us right through the physiology in a way we can understand. The way that the human metabolic pathway has evolved over 5 million years is ostensibly that your metabolism will happily run on a mixture of fats and protein or carbohydrates and protein less well than the, than the fats, but you can survive, you can subsist for a goodly number of years on a carbohydrate-protein-based diet, let's say three to five, ideally, after which the deficiencies sink in and you're one of those vegans that has to quit, one of the 84%. What the human metabolic system cannot do is do well on a fuel mix, which is fats, carbohydrates, and protein, the mixed macronutrient standard Western diet. The Randall cycle ostensibly boiled down to its most simple way of describing it is that of fats and carbohydrates – your body will be running on one or the other primarily based on what is being provided chronically. Your body will set up its enzymes, its pathways, optimally for the predominant intake. The other one will be, for want of a better term, discouraged, locked out to some degree, discouraged from flowing through the metabolic pathway. So if you eat a bunch of carbohydrates, you are not going to be efficient at using fats. If you're running on fats, not only are you not efficient in carbohydrates, they're locked out completely because they're toxic at that state. Anytime you raise your blood glucose above its homeostatic level, its set point, that is toxic. That will damage the physical structures of your cell. It is a poison. You don't want that. So therefore, it becomes obvious that what we do is we follow our genetic gift, our anthropological past, we follow the way our biological systems are designed, our metabolic pathways are designed by natural selection pressure, and we eat a food source that is appropriate for us as a species, and that is fat and protein with almost no carbohydrate. There are very few foods found naturally in our world that are a relatively even mixture of all three macronutrients. Because things are either animals, which are rich in protein and fat, or they're plants, which are rich in carbohydrate and, pro and not so good in protein, as it turns out. There are very few things that naturally exist having all three macros in it. And as such, the biological system of a human being and many other animals as well are not geared for that. And they lock each other out, as it turns out. So that's basically what the Randall cycle is. It's, it's the thing that determines that we need to run ostensibly on either carbohydrate or fat. And then you think about it, well, the diet rich in carbohydrate versus the diet rich in fat, which one of those diets is likely to be nutrient deficient and cause catastrophic health failure in about five years? Oh, right, it's the one based on plants. So that's the one to avoid. Now, is there any evidence from anthropology that, in fact, that's in line with what we have done. Is there any slam dunk actual science evidence that human beings definitely ate almost nothing but the flesh and fat of animals? Yes. It's the stable isotope testing I alluded to earlier. Slam dunk. Every single test of every long bone collagen that's been extracted from all human remains found anywhere on this planet of any age over about 11,000 years and less than 350,000, they all tell the same story within about 5%. Human beings are obligate hypercarnivores. We ate almost no plants at all. So maybe we should just do that and forget this ring-finched area of pseudoscience called human nutrition science, which actually, as I said earlier, is propaganda money-driven, and the furthest thing from science I've ever seen. Let's come back to your one meal a day. Is it typically a steak, or are you into ground meat, making burgers? What does that look like? 
Mostly it's steaks. Mostly it's um, rump and rump cap, otherwise known as picanha, which is a very fatty um, cut, a uh, very tender cut. Mostly what we'll do is we'll sear that on a barbecue and we'll do it, you know, a week in advance for our intake of steaks and that. And then the steaks are finished off by the day in an air fryer to the level of cooking desired by the individual person concerned who's going to be eating it. Um, that's very, very typical. Occasionally, we have burgers made from ground beef, very occasionally. Occasionally, we'll have lamb steaks, pork steaks, pork ribs, that kind of thing. Even more rarely than that, we'll have chicken and fish, seafoods variously. And um, yeah, very, very typically, it's it's beef steak. And how do you navigate eating out? Is it typically a steak too? Largely, we don't eat out. Um, Pim and I live rurally, about 30 minutes drive from the nearest village on a farm. We leave this property when we have to, which is really, or once a week we do a thing called doing things on Thursdays where we'll go out and enjoy the sun, swim in the ocean, go see kayaking, something like that. Um, and sometimes there's food involved with that, in which case we have found a local restaurant that does purely carnivorous meals, or at least things that you can say, yes, I'll have that, but hold the, and they're usually pretty happy with that. It's no big deal. It's no big problem. Or occasionally we might go, you know what? I might just have these French fries because I fancy them. And then spend the next 48 hours going, why the hell did I eat those French fries? I knew damn well what was going to happen. Here it is. So, yeah, it's, I mean, eating out, goodness, probably once a quarter, three or four times a year. That's how often that happens. Not a big concern then. Not a, not a big issue for us. What kinds of questions will you ask if you're at a restaurant? Do you get into like what kind of oils is steak being marinated in? And do you get into that nuance, spices and... Not really, not really. I mean, because at the end of the day, for something that you do four times a year, the main thing is keeping the most part of everything we eat at home right. And so we do that. So Bart, we've gone deep into the diet like I wanted to. Before we part ways here, let's talk about other lifestyle things that you're doing to keep healthy. Things that are non-negotiable aside from the diet. Love it. Yeah. So in my practice and on my YouTube channel, I am promoting the absolute inescapable importance of living a life which is minimally going to cause inflammation. We want to reduce your chronic systemic inflammatory overburden. As such... The single most important thing you can do is eat a 100% carnivorous diet, ideally. Ideally, consistently and persistently. Um, and ideally, without the transgressions. But I'm not going to sit here in judgment, as I've said. Easily the most important thing, hugely the most important thing. If you're only going to do one thing, I would do that. Change your diet slowly. Don't do this overnight. Seriously. The second most important thing in my mind and in my experience is the range of nutraceuticals I was referring to earlier. Um, these, the flagship product is a product, as I say, which causes your bone marrow to release your adult stem cells. Adult stem cells have two roles. One, differentiating into brand new adult cell lines to replace cells that are worn, degraded, diseased, broken down, no longer functioning ideally. So the stem cell comes along, binds to the dysfunctional cell, causes it to self-destruct and dissolve, clears away the detritus, and then turns into a new cell to replace the one that it's got rid of. And that new cell, get this, has a full-length telomere. So the more of these that you can get into your body ostensibly the younger the tissues of your body are in effect because we we know that telomere shortening is the biological clock of age so if you can replace 
a cell line that's just about at its end with one with a full, well, why wouldn't you? That's ideal. Okay, let However, me jump in before you go to the next one. Please. What's the name of the product? And the product is there is other cool. foods or lifestyle things we can do, exercise or whatever it is, that have the same effect? Yes. Good questions. Okay. So the product is the, the flagship product is called Stem Enhance Ultra. It has a green label, and you'll see it when you go to the website. Are there other things that you can do to encourage the release of these adult stem cells? Yes. Fasting more than 72 hours will cause an uptick in the release of these things. So you can do that for free if you want. However, that requires you to fast for at least 72 hours, and the actual amount of stem cells being released by that will be vastly less. So it's not remotely as effective. I'd pay the money, frankly. Um, what else can you do? Exercise will do it. High intense exercise at the right volume on the right schedule, etc. It's tough to get the to get it right if you're not an exercise physiologist and you're not able to take your bloods to test that you're getting it right. So that's difficult. Um, you may have heard of a substance called EPO, and I'm not talking about evening primrose oil. I'm talking about erythropoietin. That stuff will do the same thing, for example. However, um, that one comes with very serious risks, whereas the product I'm talking about doesn't come with such risks. It's, there's a control mechanism on it. Um, so there's that. In terms of side effects, negative effects, anything that people have reported to us, really nothing to speak of at all. It, it, it seems to be a product that comes completely without negative side effects, which is quite stunning, really. Um, this is a product that I myself have personally taken for the last 14 years, 10 of those as a retail customer, not as someone involved in the affiliate marketing of this product. This is a company that doesn't so much advertise. What it does is it's like a multi-level type setup without being like a multi-level company. Um, what we do is we encourage people with social media spheres of influence to mention that this stuff exists and what it is a few times a week on their social media offerings and people flock. They buy it because it does exactly what it says it does. It's fantastic stuff. So that's our flagship product. We have other products that support that product. We have an anti-inflammatory, which is very, very powerful and does not have the negative side effects of pharmacological ones either. We have a blood flow optimizer because if you're going to release stem cells, you want them to be able to get there. So a lot of people have very, very compromised blood supplies, blood flow. So we can sort that out. There's a collagen supplement for folks that are into that. Um, and there's also a skincare range based on encouraging the stem cells under your skin to come forward and produce new skin cells and make you look younger than you are and stuff. So that's our product range in a nutshell. The important thing about the adult stem cells before they turn into a new heart cell, toenail cell, skin cell, not hair follicle cells apparently, incredible, um, is that these stem cells, before they differentiate when they're still in your blood circulation, they'll be exuding exosomes, tens of thousands of these things every hour, and the exosomes contain... RNA, DNA messages, sometimes fully formed proteins, signaling molecules, all sorts of things, and they can regulate other tissues. Like if you've got inflamed tissue, these exosomes can send a calm down, let's not be so inflamed message. Stem cells that encounter cancerous material in your body will send that a message self-destruct. This is a powerful product. This is an incredible product. It's the only product that I support, promote to my people at all. And I've looked at many products. The third most important thing you can do sounds crazy. It sounds like crystal waving woo-woo, but it's not. I've looked into the science because that's what I do being a scientist. Um, it's grounding yourself electrically, making a connection between you and Earth, an electrical connection, allowing you to absorb electrons from the surface of the earth into your body. These electrons are then used by your body to repair damage done by oxidants, free radicals. Basically, 
the natural, normal way that a body has antioxidant effect is nothing to do with antioxidants found in foods. You're supposed to get your antioxidant effect by being grounded to the earth. In the last 100, 150 years, we've isolated ourselves from the earth. Rubber shoes, rubber soles on our shoes, car tires that are rubber, living in buildings that are electrically isolated because of the electrical code, etc., etc., etc. We spend most of our time not connected to the earth. Disastrous. A couple of things that happen when you ground yourself to the earth. Immediately. The effective viscosity, the thickness, if you like, or tackiness of your blood reduces by a factor of three. Immediately. Like that second. So now your heart has to work one third as hard as it had to the second before to push the same amount of blood through the same vascular system. That's got to be a win. Got to be a win. Um, aberrant cortisol profiles normalize. Normal ones remain normal. Okay, good. Healing is expedited from injuries. Sleep quality increases. Your brainwave activity changes from alpha to delta, or the other way around, I can't remember. Anyway, it's fight and flight to rest and recuperate so that you can feel relaxed and sleep and deals with anxiety and all that kind of stuff, etc., etc., etc. There's all sorts of effects that have been noted associated with grounding versus people who are told they're grounded are given grounding kit that's a sham kit that isn't grounded, all else being relatively equal. So, sure, it's, you know, low numbers of subjects and all of that, but it's, you know, it looks to me like a pretty – sensible and innocuous thing to do. So I do. I, I ground myself about 20 hours a day. How do I do that? The bed that we sleep in is grounded. We have a mat under the bed sheet, which is connected to a stake in the ground outside. Um, down this end of the house when I'm working in the office, I am currently leaning on a mouse pad, which is grounded. And sleeping and working takes out about 20 hours of my day usually. So four hours I'm floating around ungrounded. Cool. So that's that's important, electrical grounding. The fourth most important thing is, also sounds crazy but isn't, that is you need to block blue wavelengths of light from entering your eyes any time that the sun is not in the sky, i.e. nighttime. Daytime, don't do this. Blue light is indicated in the daytime. At nighttime, no. Again, in the last hundred years or so, we are bathing ourselves in artificial and blue wavelengths well after dark, our eyes are receiving these light uh, frequencies and it's telling our body that's a completely different time of day to what it really is. It stuffs up our circadian rhythms and things and causes inflammation and all sorts of problems. So I just have clip-ons and sometimes I have full goggle style as well that seal around and so no blue light can get in whatever. It just depends on you know what I can bother doing on any given day. And then the fifth most important thing on my list of anti-inflammatory things is the right amount of the right exercise at the right intensity on the right schedule, which is a whole discussion by itself. And given that it's number five in importance, I don't usually spend a lot of time on that, except if people are paying me for a consult and want to know about how to do that, in which case we can go through it. Because among other things, actually my first my first um, advanced research degree was in exercise physiology. So I'm actually that first and foremost. And that was before I did human nutrition for a bit and then eventually cardiovascular pathophysiology. Um, so it's kind of a – I come from the, that kind of broad base. Uh, I don't know if there are too many people floating around with multiple advanced research degrees. Most people have got one. Um, it's not that I'm banging my own drum or anything. I'm just saying the fact that I've got three gives me – a broader base of expertise than most people, I guess. And with that experience, with having researched actively in that area and with having dealt with thousands of clients over the last few years, that's how I've molded this top five, I think. And so people often say to me, oh, what about this? What about that? What about cold plungers? What about, you know, all sorts of different hacks that people can put in their lives for anti-inflammatory effect? And I usually say, fine if you want to try it um it's not on my top five because it just hasn't shown itself to me to be that clearly worthy of being in the top five so those are my five carnivore diet 
It's a raw product daily, every day. Uh, electrical grounding as much as possible, avoiding blue light after dark and exercise. All right, a couple of follow-up questions before I let you go. One being brands when it comes to blue light blocking glasses and the grounding technology. Right. Blue light blocking glass is quite simple, really. When you put them on and you look through them at something that is blue, the sky, the splash screen of windows, etc., or something that you know from everyday life to be a blue thing, that will appear, if the, if the glasses are correct, that will appear either green, grey, or black, depending on the shade of blue that that thing is. If you can see any blue light at all, no good. A lot of people, a lot of companies sell these computer blue light blocking spectacles that are clear and do not distort the color. Well, when you block blue, what happens is everything turns amber. The lens itself has to be dark amber to block blue. If it's not that color, it's not blocking the blue, is it? It's blocking a portion of the blue. That's how they get away with calling them blue blockers. That's not good enough. That will not do the trick. They must be dark amber lenses. Um, and yeah, you can even go really quite crazy with this as well. A friend of mine, name of Harry Sopanos, that has his own fine, fine YouTube channel, by the way, which you can look up if you want to. He has removed every light bulb in his house and replaced it with an amber one that has no blue in it. So that not only does it not get into his eyes, but also because your skin can also detect blue and that can throw things up. So he's, I mean, $25, $30 a bulb though. Okay, Harry, cool. If you like, I'm not doing that myself. I'm just doing the lenses thing. And I think that's the important thing. So they must be dark amber color. You must not be able to actually see any blue. In terms of the grounding equipment, the way to check it is to ground yourself using the grounding equipment, be that a, a mat on your bed or a mat on your desk or whatever it is. Connect yourself, remain connected for about 60 seconds at least before you test and then put a multimeter across yourself. So you would put the, um, the black lead, you would put on the mat and the red lead you would put on your skin somewhere. The voltage should be very, very close to zero. Like in the tenths of a millivolt range is what you're going to get to probably. If that's not happening, it's not working. Because when you're disconnected, as I am now, what happens is over the next few seconds, my body will build up a positive charge. There'll be a voltage difference between me and Earth, a significant, like several volts, potentially. So when I connect to the mat, over the next few seconds, that positive charge will drift down back towards zero with respect to Earth, precisely because I'm absorbing electrons through the mat coming from the Earth into my body to neutralize those charges that the body builds up just by being alive. So that's the way to test on that one. All right, last question for you. I know you mentioned the exercise is something you share with people that are working with you one-on-one, -on -one, but really broad question for somebody that's exercising. Are you a fan of the HIT, cardio, resistance training, or a combo of the three? HIIT and resistance training at the top end of your individual intensity spectrum. 45 minutes for the total session, which is probably a work-to-rest ratio of five to one no more than about four times a week and never on consecutive days. Never ever do cardio for any significant period of time at moderate intensity. The stuff they tell you is great for you and is good for you and the cardiovascular fitness, stuff, all, all the stuff, basically, no. Absolutely under no circumstances should you do that level of exercise. So very, very low intensity, like basically almost resting, like maybe walking, you could do that for hours at a time. That's fine. Hiking, whatever, low intensity. High intensity burst and repeat or resistance training exercise, fine. Everything in the middle, absolutely no, under any circumstances. Unless a person says to me, oh, well, but that's my sport, though. I have to train that way to perform well in my sport. To which I say, here's what I suggest. 
change your sport because that is not good for you long term. You should not do that kind of exercise. Not designed for it. Bad idea. All right, Bart, good place to end it. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Far reaching conversation. And uh, we're going to link up that supplement, your website, your YouTube channel, everything in the show notes. And I just want to thank you. Not at all. Thank you. It's it's a privilege and a pleasure to cross pollinate. You know, if there's anybody else out there that's that's running a channel that wants to have a chat with me about anything, please do get in contact and we'll make it happen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now that you're done with Bart, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Sean. He's a carnivore MD who will teach you all about how to reverse visceral fat. I'll see you over there. Visceral fat causes inflammation throughout your body, leading to disease. It starts when you're young. It's the first expression of disease.